Hey guys, how's it going? Um, thank you very much for that acknowledgement, John, and the whole team from Sovereign Canada for uh, putting this uh, together. Um, season four, really cool. Uh, who knew we'd be on Zoom for season four, uh, FML, but here we are. Um, I really wanna thank everyone who showed up today. Uh, I'm sure you guys all have as much Zoom fatigue as I know I do. Um, towards that, we're gonna keep this actual session of speakers to about 45 minutes. Uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll make sure that we use our remaining time to get to them. Um, so yeah, thank you all for being here. We'll try to keep this content as engaging as possible and really work on uh, uncovering the things we really wanna know from sort of the really wide range of speakers we have today. Um, through that, the first person I really wanna introduce is Evelyn Chick, um, because in terms of casting a wide range, she is uh, absolutely doing it with the Evelyn Chick projects uh, and a variety of uh, other endeavors that we're gonna give her a moment to speak to uh, right after we get through everybody else. Uh, we also have um, Gabrielle from Little Lab in Montreal with us, uh, who has done from everything I understand, uh, absolute incredible job pivoting into the uh, cocktail kit uh, phenomenon uh, when we, first spoke about it, I was blown away by her success, uh, to be honest, jealously in comparison to uh, Sybil's uh, lackluster efforts in that. Uh, similarly, we have uh, Chris from Vancouver uh, with Lavish Liquid. Um, he's really done a great job taking an events company and dialing it into sort of the needs of consumers uh, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, also on the other side of what opportunity is, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, we've got Jesse from Vine Arts in Calgary. They are a, um, a merchant of fine wines and spirits who have taken the opportunities that uh, changes in the market have allowed uh, to really maximize everything for their own business and uh, sort of the cocktail community around them. Um, and then if you haven't met me before, my name is Nick Kennedy. I am the senior executive barback at a dive bar in Toronto called Civil Liberties. Uh, and the thing, uh, I think the reason I was asked to uh, host this talk is Civil has done um, a comical amount of pivoting. We don't use that word anymore because a pivot ends at 180 degrees and then you start turning around. Uh, what we're actually all doing is pirouetting or spinning. So we say we pirouette, not pivot. Um, or like in the 1990s, John Woo films were letting the doves out. I don't know if anyone is an action fan uh, like I am, but those movies were famous for his character spinning and doves would come out of their coats. Um, so often when someone comes up with a new idea in one of our meetings, we say, yeah, that'll let the doves out. Um, but the first thing Civil did uh, is we opened the Civil Liberties Bottled Offerings, uh, the CLBO, which was the direct competitor to the LCBO. That lasted three weeks until we got our cease and desist from the LCBO. Our fonts were very similar. Uh, and then we really dived into Zoom when it was an exciting and novel technology um, to enter people's homes and give them sort of bartenderly conversation. Uh, and then we've sort of just chased um, everything we can with um, the uh, edging on to new and new styles of bringing cocktails to people's homes. Um, and it's been a lot of pivoting uh, and we've sort of been first to do it because we don't have a menu. It means we don't have a brand identity to protect so we can really go out on the edge. Um, I think somebody who is building incredible brand identity though right now is Evelyn Chick with the Evelyn Chick projects. So Evelyn, if you want to give us a quick like five, 10 minute overview of how you've gone through this pandemic. I think it's a, it's a great place to start. Thank you, Nick. And I really loved the CLBO, by the way. I was the first one, I think, to be like, repost, repost. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm like so humbled to be able to like tell a little bit about my story. Um, but essentially before the pandemic, I was a beverage director for a large hospitality group. And very quickly we realized that massive 200 to 300 person venues aren't going to be a thing for a little bit. Um, so uh, we essentially had to lay off quite a few people. And I think in our preliminary calls, I mentioned how sort of traumatic it is to kind of tell your staff that the path that they had dreamt of as bartenders, bar managers are no longer going to be the same. But um, as a personal and uh, and professional pirouette, I have uh, started and uh, 
kind of gone back to an initial project that I started a few years ago called the Evelyn Chick Projects. And um, it is meant to be sort of like a creative hub for drink enthusiasts to just kind of dial in um, to um, share recipes and experience things virtually. And that kind of became my um, umbrella company that uh, I do a lot of drink consulting and uh, sort of soft ambassadorship, if you will, for brands that aren't necessarily a um, full-time ambassador position. Um, and from that, I partnered up with Salty Paloma, which is a, a local salt and sugar company. And uh, we together co-branded as Salty and uh, started providing cocktail kits and cocktail experiences to consumers. And um, quickly, very quickly spiraled into this big thing where we're doing like a 1500 kits in December and now continuing with corporate events, which I know a lot of people on this panel also do. And uh, a month ago, we started Stay at Home Cocktail Club, which is a uh, subscription service for non-alcoholic cocktail kits, because um, I'm a huge sort of uh, advocate for inclusivity in drinks. And I love that we're able to provide that service for guests who aren't necessarily enjoying um, just alcohol, but different and interesting mixers as well. So that's sort of the scope of um, what I'm working with right now, but I'm really thankful to still be here and be able to sort of pass on a little bit of knowledge to whoever's looking to branch out. Yeah, we are definitely going to squeeze that stone of knowledge for all of its, uh, its, its fine uh, in, insightful juices. Uh, similarly, uh, Gabrielle, you um, have done a great job with the corporate cocktail kits. Uh, we were talking about that and I got uh, nervous just listening to how much well, you guys are doing so please let us know how you found the, the that peak um yes yeah, so um yeah thanks um, nick for introducing me so well we've been uh, working really hard uh, on that project so uh, as a few of you uh, may know i'm the owner of a uh, bar lab so we are a cocktail bar located in montreal and uh, whenever and we also manage uh, an event company usually so we do about um, 200 events a year from cocktail course to uh, 5,000 um, cocktail service and uh, we have project on the market. So when everything's um, closed down, uh, I passed kind of like a, the first two, three weeks um, without really knowing what was happening, a little bit panicking because you have the impression that everything is falling and it's the end of the world. Um, but um, we start to do a cocktail course, virtual cocktail course um, in um, April, May last year and people weren't really uh, open to those idea at the at this point because i mean virtual it wasn't a thing everyone was a little bit like what the fuck is that and um so in up so few months passes and in october we decided um just to do a cocktail box like like this and i was like oh fab uh, we're just gonna make a few for christmas it might work might not who knows? And uh, for uh, that, uh, we uh, we had to completely close the phone and uh, close the order about um, half of December because we were uh, getting uh, smashed by it, all the orders that were coming through. We sent about uh, 4,000 um, cocktail bucks, mostly for corporate, mostly for um, uh, Christmas party. So uh, our biggest order was at 350 boxes. We manage all the um, delivery uh, by post, by car, um, and we do everything uh, to, um, to make sure that our box is an activity, that we really like educate people about how to do a cocktail um, A to Z. Like everyone have like um, our home, um, uh, do your do it yourself uh, cocktail syrup kit uh, you press uh, your fresh citrusy uh, you cut your ginger and you do uh, all the rim of your glasses and uh, we um, sell the bucks with uh, of course cocktail course uh, virtual I have uh, four amazing um, mixologist uh, bartender with me who give those courses sometimes it's uh, at their home sometimes it's at the bar and uh, we try to be like really familiar with people we always um, don't them that everyone's missing them in the industry and um and so so i've been uh, trying to surviving uh, in this i think the most uh, challenging part uh was uh, to lose all my team as Evelyn said um it's something that that you you couldn't think that 
you know, fire, firing everyone without any reason. Um, of course, pandemic. And for me, working alone is really hard. I'm a really team person. I love the energy of everyone and and like taking idea and brainstorming. And I mean, we're bartender, like, you know, our job is to serve people, to be with people and like working alone from home. It's quite a challenge, but, but I think um, I'm pretty lucky that uh, people are encouraging um, the local business, the restaurant, the bar are like, they are really, really uh, um, like, I don't know how to say it, but they are like, quite thankful that we offer those kind of service and that we can find like new idea for them to have an activity and have a drink like so I mean it's, it's really important for us to improve um, we are selling like happiness usually and um, so uh, cocktail boxes are just a, a new way to send happiness instead of serving them a cocktail at the bar so we try to bring the bar at their home if you want to it's also ingenious civil has been lucky enough to keep on our staff but it's so that we can do all the prep of making the syrups making the guests do the syrup like uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. still for the next one limes you got it um i thought it was smart when I said the lime, bag of sugar lime yeah. juice, but like an extension of that idea um similarly i thought it was smart when i was doing large-scale events like miracle and everything i do but i think somebody who's great at that sort of event game and has really pivoted well is chris uh from lavish liquid out in vancouver so chris if you want to just give everyone a sort of a roundup of what your pandemic horrors have been we'd love to hear <laughs> yeah i mean uh i wouldn't call mine as much of a horror and I'm, I'm gonna say like i'm quite lucky and i feel very uh grateful for the fact that we made the switch quite early you know, it was only one week into the pandemic and I had a bunch of inventory I had to unload. So I switched right away. I hit up all my contacts, uh, every single corporate client, wedding clients, party that I had scheduled. I said, well, what are you guys looking to do now? I have all these cocktails available still. Um, we went from a, a team of 50 plus down to four, which was pretty sad, but uh, we were still able to keep our lights on. And uh, it, was, it was very interesting um, to kind of you know, reflect what Gabrielle was saying a lot of people weren't very receptive to the virtual cocktail class idea at the beginning. Uh, but once people started to understand like this is kind of the no new normal, uh, it it's been very well received. Uh, we kind of went through as much volume as we anticipated we were gonna do in one year in four months. So from March until December, we did over 10,000 kits. Um, you know, it was absolutely insane. Uh, but you know, we didn't have the luxury of still having a, a bar as some of the other Vancouver bar restaurant owners do here to kind of keep things going. We didn't get locked down as hard as other provinces did. So uh, it was very crucial for us to try to keep that revenue in. And um, with, with my corporate clients and, and client contacts, they were very supportive, again, supporting local. We partner with a lot of really great distilleries and it's been a, a really fun experience and a uh, learning curve for sure to switch over to doing things virtually and, and providing cocktail kits for people in the comfort of their own home. Um, you know, again, what Gabrielle is doing, ours is a little bit similar, but a little bit different. We aren't doing things as DIY. It's a bit more simple for the consumer where they just wanna have like, enjoy a nice cocktail. It's three-step process and they can just sip away and, and not not worry about it so um but when our, we do our virtual classes it is more diy where we, we we put them to work we make them juice their own citrus and make their syrups and stuff like that so it's it's been a lot of fun for sure and i think the one thing that uh i would like to maybe share with everyone here who's obviously trying to figure out new ways to generate revenues it's like well look at the market look where it's kind of shifting right um DoorDash and skip the dishes, that convenience factor, everyone's looking for that. Everyone wants to find something that's convenient, easy for them to basically just like go online, purchase it, sit at home and just wait for it to show up at their door. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the future, sadly. Um, it's not wow. gonna go, it's not gonna go away. I do, I do think that once bar and restaurants open up, people will still go there, but the convenience thing is still gonna be a normal. I think be, we were going to open the debate up so early. I think it's going to go <laughs> the other way, but let's make sure we get Jesse's sort of perspective. So when he hops in and agrees or disagrees, everyone knows where he's coming from. <laughs> uh, he's coming out of Calgary uh, and again, Vine Arts. So I think Jesse, when we first talked, 
had said he thought he might sort of sit this one out a little bit because his perspective is very different than a lot of the hospitality thing people, but I think it's a, a really valuable one. So kick it off from there. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I, I came in a little sheepish to our little pre-meeting because, you know, having the benefit of being on the retail side of things, at least operationally, I mean, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, and unfortunately, a lot of you are governed by uh, your provincial overlords who are a lot more uh, tight ass than we are here in Alberta. But, um, you know, being on the retail side of things here at Vine Arts, and we're in Calgary, we have two locations. Um, we, we opened first in 2012 so we've been in the game for a little bit but um you know we saw the opposite you know we saw the mad the mad rush and and you know a spike in sales initially um and just to maybe soften the blow a little bit we also have a cocktail bar called proof and a restaurant called donna mac um so i feel the pain on that end but my business partner jeff gets to deal with the the day-to-day -day of that and then we also have a barware company called fifth and vermouth which is the newer baby and uh, we're minority partners in but I mean on the Vine Art side when everything went down I mean at first it was just this mad rush to try to keep product on the shelf because I think there was a point where we didn't have a bottle of wine under $30 left because people were just hoarding thinking that liquor stores might get shut down but once that initial sort of wave kind of calmed and and people realized they could they could chill out and the cannabis and liquor were going to stick around on the retail side at least um, we kind of had to figure out what what to do and we were still always concerned had the same concerns as a lot of people you know making our payroll paying our staff what if things do get shut down um, but we kind of first uh, fell back on something that's served us really well since day one which is to find partners that are complementary rather than competitive I mean, we've almost in 10 years barely ever paid for advertising or promotion we prefer instead to to find ways to collaborate with people and join up and do things that are fun and interesting and engaging and can kind of leverage followings from multiple businesses and sort of uh, you know make the you know the whole greater than its parts and so we had, we started reaching out right away to people and saying like hey how can we work together what can we do how can we help you restaurants bars um, you know sugar water bar who has a sort of maybe a similar concept to Chris here in Calgary where the you know very events focused bartending um, they approached us and we teamed up with them early on and our first cocktail kit we launched and also, I will say that uh, an epic failure had kind of put us in a good position, not to do that cheesy sort of fail forward thing. But we had launched a, a cocktail of the month club a couple of years ago, which did not work well. People people were not down. But because of that, we had a whole bunch of cocktail boxes and, and stuffing and, and things just sitting, waiting. And so we were kind of in a good position that way. But we reached out um, to Sugarwater and, and talked to them. And, and we kind of found a way to say, how can we join forces and also take advantage of this sentiment that's finally getting some teeth you know people have talked about you know supporting small and supporting local for a long time but you know in the background i think a lot of people have still when push came to shove like uh you know i can order this on amazon or i'll just stop at whatever chain place on my way home people really start to think about like after this pandemic's over what are the places i want to still exist you know and so that support local sentiment really had teeth and people were really putting their money where their mouth was. And so our first cocktail kit, we were like, okay, this one kit you're buying supports, you know, eight local businesses, eight calorie based businesses. And that, that people, people really love that. So it was, and it wasn't just, you know, really a, a marketing thing. It was also us being in that advantageous position on the resale side, wanting to really engage and help out. So and subsequent kits, subsequent things, we, we found other ways to team up with other restaurants, other bars, like you give us the cocktail, we'll buy a gift card or whatever we can buy to include in the box and Vine Arts will take on that cost. Um, and let's, let's always keep it in the front of people's heads. Like, don't forget to, you know, order takeout to buy cocktail kits, not just from us, but if you want places to be around, you know, you've got you've to put your money where your mouth is and, and support those small places. So it was a way for us to, you know, support them even in a small way financially, but more than that, really always keep in the front of consumers' minds, like, this is, these are real people, real businesses, real faces, real families, you know, real, real roofs we have to keep over our heads. So, you know, whatever you can do, make sure you do it to kind of keep on top of that. So that, that's something I would say that served us really well is that, that really collaborative um, sort of mentality and, and multiplying that with other businesses. 
I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you want a cocktail culture to come back to, these will be uh, the things that have to happen for it. I think it's, we often forget in the sort of decade and a half of success we've had as a community of cocktail enthusiasts and cocktail producers that there's been an ebb and flow of when this happens in our trade. And uh, if we want to make sure that we're not on this part of it, that collaborative attitude, I think, is what's going to get us through this. Um, towards sort of those changes and how you pivoted in them, this is a question to start with, with Jesse, because he may know the most. Open to everybody. John Splunsky, if he's going to talk about it, has no more than four minutes of talking time, though. What <laughs> laws or regulations do you guys think are going to be continuing on the other side of this? Maybe speak about it from your local perspective, but also as a cross Canada, what's going to stay? Because obviously these changes were induced by the, the thing going around that global pandemic, uh, but it, it would be really hard to peel a lot of them back. So uh, yeah, I guess Jesse, as a retail merchant, what do you think is going to be the biggest change across Canada and then individual in your markets as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, not, I don't like to give the AGLC too much credit, but uh, they do deserve a little bit in this case because they have you know, acted quickly our Alberta Gaming Liquor Commission or Alberta Gaming Liquor Cannabis Commission uh, to to put in place things quickly to attempt to help people and address issues. So I think, and I've talked to the Alberta Liquor Store Association about this. I mean, uh, restaurants and bars being able to offer off sales, that's something absolutely that's going to stick around. Um, you know, people are going to be able to sell it as they always should have, you know, you should be able to sell a bottle of wine with your takeout meal or um, you know, who cares if a, a bar is selling a full cocktail kit that has a, a full closed bottle of gin? I mean, it's not going to cause uh, society to crumble overnight. So I think that's going to stick around. I mean, uh, we also, on, on the other side, as much as we've had a really open system in Alberta, for a long time, we were really had our hands tied in terms of things like infusions, uh, things like pre-bottled drinks. We weren't allowed to do any of that. There was no pre-batching. There was no, um, you know, throwing a whatever, uh, you know, a chili and a bottle of vodka, like it wasn't, wasn't allowed. And, and that's really, they've, they've eased up on that, which is nice. And I think those bottled cocktails, be able to offer that as a takeout service or delivery service is going to stick around, which is great. And I think people will do well to focus on that here in Alberta. And I think having a, a, you know, a smart program, the other thing we saw, I think initially was restaurants and bars when they were allowed to do that sort of off sale service, attempting to apply that you know bar restaurant markup to those products and that i think people very quickly found that they got a little bit of support up front because people obviously want to support local but i think it it requires a change of mindset to you know there's there's two pricing structures uh you know and um on on one side for that takeout you kind of have to um you know look more at maybe a retail pricing model to have success if you want to sell as a restaurant say bottles of wine you know, you can't charge three times wholesale if it's if it's a pure takeout sort of model. If there's no service um, as a Absolutely. part of that, um, so I think people had to really rethink. And, and you know, to obviously everyone's credit, most people did, but some people really held on to that. Uh, you know, I was in I was in Banff too for a little like as close of a getaway as we could recently, and I I saw that. You know, I just wanted to buy some beer for the hotel room, but rather than going to the liquor store, I was going to try to buy from a restaurant or a bar. And I saw the whole swing, you know, there was people still trying to charge, you know, $10 for a PBR, even though I was just literally going to go, if I was going to get it, pick it up and take it out and someone else charging three bucks. So I think you're going to see that come into play a lot. And again, I think a really smart, you know, program for, for bottle cocktails and takeout cocktails um, Absolutely. is going to carry I wanna, forward. I want to take that and push it back over to people who have seen the most success with those programs uh, again as somebody who has admittedly stuck to the you'll pay me 15 bucks for the goddamn cocktail model uh, with less success uh chris and gabrielle what kind of markup if you're willing to share or talk about the pricing structures you guys use for success and then we're going to have evelyn pick up the back end of that with how you do that with non-alcoholic because that from civil's perspective is even harder uh so i guess gabrielle or chris whoever wants to start how did you price your models to find that success because i feel like a lot of people who dialed in today want that success uh, ladies first, please, Gabrielle, go ahead. Um, how did I price the cocktail box? You mean? Yeah, kit particular, I, like like a grocer thing. Right? Yes, I um, I you know we we are not used to to um overcharge uh, what we're doing um at the lab, and um and I think that when we start in May uh, doing the virtual class, I was asking for a hundred thirty dollar, uh, the two hours, and no one was buying. 
Okay. So it was too expensive for everyone. Um, so uh, we start the price for the cocktail course at 300 uh, for uh, October. And I thought like that, that was quite a fair price quite a fair price, sorry, and um, not too expensive. I could manage to pay the staff for realizing that um, that we were actually one of the cheapest on the market. Uh, so I just, you know, calculate a little bit my cost, how I would pay my staff um, for an hour. So I pay my mixologist $60, uh, $60 the hour at the cocktail course. Um, of course, it's quite not a lot when um, when you think about like uh, as maybe like an independent worker. Um, but all my cocktail course are pre pre um, pre done. Okay, so the mixologists have or the bartender have nothing uh, really to study or to create um, for doing it, um, and he can do it from his home. And I furnish everything. Yeah. Um, and so I calculate a little bit this um, with a market price, of course, and uh, including a little bit of the subvention of the government. I mean, we did this for survive, first of all, sure. and not for create like a completely new market, because mm -hmm. I really think that uh, when everything's going to go back to normal, um, yes, of course, we're going to make some virtual class probably because there's some um, corporate team who are all over Canada and still going to want that because, I mean, it's still fun. And like, you know, co-worker all across the country can see themselves and have a drink. But I think that for most of the happy hours meeting and like corporate party, uh, people would, uh, would want it to do it like in person. Um, for the cocktail boxes, we just calculate the ingredient the post. Um, I uh, consult with um, someone who's um, specialized in manufacturing um, to help me create uh, the chain of uh, fabrication of the boxes. Because when we send, um, when we save 200, 300 bucks a day, uh, we have to be uh, quite organized uh, to make sure that the bucks are not um, incomplete or there's no mistake um, so that was quite a challenge so I helped me to go through the cost and how how much time I have to take to make one box and um, and of course all the ingredients and uh, and the impression of the cocktail sheet and uh, very cool. everything a little bit that I do I'm I'm the cheapest box on the market uh, we sell $17 recipes um, but um, but I think it's a fair price. I make a little bit of money out of it. I can survive with the thing. So and I the bar could like, be there when you reopen, which I think is, you, as you said, survival. Like you're, you'll be there, yeah. which is the real key, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, like the, we want to keep the structure. As we yeah. say, we want to keep the bar. Uh, we want to keep the, the name of the lab. I don't want to throw 10 years of um, business um, out of the garbage because of the pandemic. And um, I have fun to yeah. do it like of course uh to make bucks and i keep contact with my customer and and uh, with the people and um i think yeah it's a little bit like to do my part if you want to totally i think keeping the brand alive is key for that and mm -hmm. client a huge exactly. over time what about yourself chris how, how do you price for success in, in like i already price very badly for catering i, <laughs> I, I fuck it up all the time I'm either like, oh, no one is here. Or like, I, I'm all over the place. I have yet to develop some sort of discipline. So I, I'd love to learn a little bit about how you do that. Well, I mean, I, I won't get into the, the pricing structure on the on the event side, but for, you know, our cocktail kits, you know, I started very similar to Gabrielle. We, we were doing the full format, 750 mils. It was quite expensive and we were seeing the same thing. We weren't getting a lot of people buying. Um, and I guess it, for the cocktail kit industry, if that's kind of be a thing, uh, it's a volume game. Right, so we switch down to doing things in the 200 mils and the 375 mil formats, and we sell them five, six, seven times more than we would any other 750 mil. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the price tag; it's just the it's the convenience. Again, to talk about the convenience thing for our corporate clients, they just want to buy something that's a quick cheers or a toast to their coworkers and staff and team and clients. They can have four drinks for 50 bucks. Uh, that's convenient to be delivered to their house, right? So um, 
it's not that much cheaper when it comes to cocktail, but again, it's convenient for them because they're not having to worry about taxi vouchers or people's safety about drinking and getting home. Uh, so uh, for us, like our start at about 42 for four drinks and, and we go up to uh, 130 for 16 drinks. So it's a, a little bit of a, kind of a mix of everything in between. And then our, our class structure as well, like we do, you know, we have minimums in order to pay for our team labor, of course, mm -hmm. and then our instructor. Uh, we're looking for more instructors. If anyone's interested in teaching, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but the, the way that we model too, because we're not uh, an actual licensed bar, we're actually considered a third party delivery service. So we actually can't mark up the liquor. We have to sell it at the retail from where we buy it from. So we buy it from a private store and we're able to sell it plus our services. So where we make our money is basically on, on the packaging and, and the mix. Like our secret recipe is where I make my money essentially. Wow. You must also be incredibly, incredibly good at emails. Uh, that, that level of organization for corporate clients, I get, I, I, I have yet to write in subscribe, unsubscribe to any of my corporate clients, but I, I get there with the, the constant emailing. So that's well, been, luckily I have an awesome sales team. There's Reese right over there. She's, she handles like sa sa sales and marketing. <laughs> um, and then Ev, how have you found uh, particularly with you're doing, like, I think for a lot of our bartenders on here, you are a success story in that you've taken the skill sets and really diversified them between selling kits and and consulting and building out all these different elements of a brand how do you set your own value or make sure people find value in those things i think the most important part is just to like believe in your value and i know it sounds crazy but a lot of people undercharge and it actually like completely cuts the credibility of everybody else who's doing a similar thing or the same thing um, drastically and it brings the whole um, scheme of what we're trying to do down. So I'm like lucky in terms of I've sort of looked at both sides of the coin because um, for the first little bit, I did have to pivot for the Donnelly group and um, create a brand new program. So essentially wiping every single thing you know um, as a beverage director and cost for takeout. So our cost percentages then was like 60, 70%, like when delivery partners are um, factored in. But I think for me now with Salty and my own brand, it's kind of like where you position yourself. So um, in the beginning, sort of like in the middle of the pandemic, I created this like Toronto to go cocktail map because where I see the value of Salty uh, providing these cocktail kits and cocktail classes isn't trying to compete with say a bar or restaurant. It's a completely different experience that I'm trying to provide. So in terms of brand development, it has to be very much like catering to those clientele that I've personally never touched as a bartender, bar operator, bar director. So um, in terms of value, we provide our corporate clients with like designs in-house. So a lot of people are like, okay, I want to hang on to my identity and like, you know, do all that. And absolutely freaking lootly, if you have a bar, if you have something that is like your particular brand, like why skew from it? Because ultimately when you reopen, that's sort of going to be your bread and butter and you have your loyal clientele that's going to follow you. But for Salty and the reason why we rebranded to look, um, like sort of like a lifestyle brand, it's very uh, adaptable to the particular client. So just to give you an example, like, um, you know, an automotive company is one of our largest clients for um, cocktail classes or corporate stuff. And they love their stuff customized to each and every single one of their um, outposts or their executive team or whatever. So we do all our design in house. So we offer that customization that to us really costs not that much, but to the client is extremely valuable. So that's where you can kind of like figure out things um, where it's within my bandwidth of doing, but providing people with that sort of um, experience that they won't get with another company. And the other thing, like I'm going to put a plug in here at the RC show 2021, like talking about the science of scaling up, like we look a lot into the stability of our cocktails. So um, fresh citrus, citrus and stuff is great, but like, how do I take that particular- no, citrus. Fresh citrus, <laughs> no bueno. Come to, the, come to my science of scaling up talk for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, go to Nick's so science of scaling up talk at RC show 2021, which I'm a bar and beverage curator with, with Christina Vera. But um, if, if I were to sort of limit myself in 
within those particular ingredients, then I can't, my reach won't be as far as say somebody who is um, getting their clients to purchase their own ingredients somewhere else. So in terms of stay at home cocktail club, which is my subscription box, it's a Canada wide service. And I just have to be really creative on the back end as to how to sell those particular boxes and ensure that they travel well three or four days out of the however many days delay or however many days it sits at the Mississauga warehouse in Toronto. Um, and kind of to go on the point of providing value, a lot of corporate clients, and I'm sure Chris and Gabrielle can talk to this, is that they have both US and Canadian counterparts. So how do you figure out ways to be able to satisfy that really large client of yours who really want their like 300, 400, however many people to be involved in that experience that you're trying to curate? So that's just sort of, you sorry? May remember, you may remember when I asked your partner to uh i did a one of these for across yeah, the world. <laughs> there was like 67 different cities and i had to like just essentially go on facebook and google friends of mine in different cities and uh, Ev's partner actually was uh, great and did uh the californian leg of our, our our kit building for that yeah and you know what like that that is you providing um you know, an experience for a guest, which is essentially, you know, what you're doing as a bartender anyway, you're trying your best to sort of um, make sure that whatever experience they're having will be what you want to curate for them, no matter which space they are in. So um, we actually just secured our US partner, um, Salty just did, and um, we have people um, on the ground in the US that are able to execute our kits, which is great. But um, yeah, I think like it's all about sort of knowing your value, sticking to it and identifying your audience, which is so freaking important because if you don't do that, then you're not going to have success no matter what you try to put out. Um, I know my audience now has drastically changed because I see the address list comes in and it's like Barry, Brampton, Mississauga, like it's not even Toronto GTA. And well, now, yeah. yeah. And, and inside of civils, when we started this exact, I agree with you totally is that we were one of the first bars to put like a comically large delivery area on our on our kits. And like, I was like, wait, who actually comes to our bar on a Friday and Saturday? When, like when I was bartending, I'd be like, fucking 905ers, excuse my language, but that's what civil is. And I'd be like, where do these people come from? And making sure you deliver kits to where the people come from was definitely an insight for us in that way. Where it's like, those may have actually been our clients the whole time. You just don't feel it when you're working in Parkdale or you're running the Donnelly group. Like, a city to be full at night needs people from the suburbs to come in, right? So going back out is, is key. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and towards that same idea of what I think is going to say, just because no one picked up on it, is in Ontario, uh, and I know we have a couple of faces here in Ontario, um, I was able to call the AGCO for the first time in my career because I no longer have capacity problems and ask questions without being afraid of getting in trouble. Um, and uh, the thing in Ontario is that we can now put anything, any individual serve in a sealed container, a sealed and secure container and go out. So you can make an Irish coffee as long as the coffee lid has an indentable cup. And you can sell people Irish coffees right at the front door. They illegally can't drink them on the street, but that becomes their problem. Uh, and similarly, and towards that line, we have made, we've uh, invested with a brand partner in a, um, a boba tea or bubble tea maker. And we're now on Uber Eats making people individual cocktails and putting them directly on ice and then serving them to the people. Because our big fear, which I'll talk about at my next talk, Scaling Up, is that the consumers' expectations, I think everyone here is doing a great job of that by the way they format them. But as we move into the next reign that everyone is talking about, which is canned cocktails, uh, when a consumer buys your cocktail in a can, uh, they've only ever interacted with shelf-stable cans that won't explode or give them botulism. Uh, and they will have that expectation of our products as well if we put them in cans. Uh, and that is a high bar to meet. So putting them in a bubble tea maker with ice, uh, people's previous expectation with that vessel is that they are going to be drinking it immediately. Uh, no one will take something with ice and leave them. In the, no reasonable person would take an old fashioned already on ice and leave it in the back of their fridge for a week and then drink it and be like, it wasn't very good. Um, so that's definitely been sort of the insight for us. And I think will stay. I think Ontario is going to have a reckon reckoning where they have to redefine what sealed and secure means. But I think you can confidently begin imagining, uh, in my mind, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit more, what comes next. But I think you can imagine being able to sling drinks off your patio onto the curb in an intelligible way um, without the AGCO in Ontario giving you 
much of a hard time. Uh, you might ask people to turn the corner before they have the drink, but uh, I'm my bar is located beside a park, and I I plan to uh, have people drinking a, a shit ton of uh, Civil Liberty branded margaritas um, in that park. So that, that's sort of the next thing. Where do you guys? We, we've talked a little bit about finding the value and where the value is going to go. And I know I started this with a poke at uh, Chris saying I, I wasn't sure that it would just be um, an Australian bartender that I know. Um, so may guess who that would be uh, said that um, when this whole thing was over, it would be like the last days of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, just like the wildest party. And I foresee some of that for sure. Um, and I'm wondering uh, how you guys plan to continue our, our never ending pirouette into that and what insights you've taken from this that you'll pull forward or maybe it's just you look forward to no longer having to survive in new ways and going back to just pouring people shots of Fernet because I know that might be where I want to go. Um, I guess Gabrielle you've talked about your sort of keeping the brand alive in the lab and I know oh. also where the lab is located in Montreal it was really sort of dependent on a good summer with that park so what are your thoughts? Um, I think that uh, when we were when we will be able to uh, come back to normal um i think we're going to keep um all the virtual service uh first of all because mm -hmm. uh, i mean it's great i we can join so many people uh, all out all over canada us and we did um, um some uh, virtual cocktail class in europe too uh for a bigger company so uh we're going to keep those services uh, definitely um cocktail boxes we'll see i mean uh We'll see if there's a market. First of all, we are um, with the project that we have in ASAQ uh, with the vermouth and the bitters. And uh, like we have the structure to keep it doing, to keep it going um, if we want to. Great. And we'll see also um, um, how we're going to manage uh, maybe like a little bit of a, a teletravail. I'm not sure how to pronounce it at home, but when you work from home, um, yep probably like uh, my director and stuff like would be able to do it a little bit. Um, one thing that I'm gonna for sure uh, change a little bit about the bar, um, I think is the, not on, like not the customer experience because I think that the lab were offering like a great experience, uh, but I mean, it's more the bartender uh, really like to uh, put in touch um, even more with the people um, to get to know them even more to, oh, there's my boyfriend. And um, to um, to keep um, uh, developing a contact with the people, like all those virtual contacts are not for me human. Um, it's really hard uh, to uh, um, understand people. I'm gonna try to, how to express well in English, I'm sorry. Um, but at the lab, I. I like. I really want my bartender to push even more the all this customer service and the knowledge about who you have in front of you and like how they how they survive about this and like um, and the taste of it and to yeah to offering them like a bar experience the bar experience that we miss so much. So I mean, towards that at Civil Liberties, it's always been the rule that if a manager comes by. You don't need to know what the person had to drink last. You don't yeah. need to know where their bill is. But if you don't know where they just came from or some fact, if you didn't actually interact with them in a way, like you don't know anything about where they just came from or where they're from or something like that, then you're probably going to get in shit about it. And I think that's what people are going to miss for sure. I, yeah, like, exactly. So to push this um, really a lot. And another thing that I think that we're going to keep is um, local um to like uh, like there's a huge uh, development in quebec for um, all the distillery and the brewery and uh, all the small um agriculture um so like the lab for sure is going to continue to encourage like even more local business local project um and uh, to try to keep uh, the, the market uh, all the seasonal fruit and vegetable of the market and also like um, distillery all over Canada. I think there's a big interest on that. Um, it's worth it to invest in ourselves, in our country, and uh, to promote um, all the brands around us who are so great. Um, and this doesn't mean to forget the rest of the world either, you know, like we're always going to have short chores behind the bar. But um, yeah. like it's just to increase the, this offer. Cool. 
And Chris, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm mute. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I do also believe that, you know, once this is over, pe people will party and they will party really, really hard, but it's definitely going to uh, be a combination of both, you know, both the virtual and in-person events will continue. Um, you know, it comes down to my corporate clients. So I'm having a lot of conversations with some of them and they like the fact that again, there's less liability and, and convenient for them to do things online. Um, it's easier to organize now that they're getting, getting used to it. Um, and, you know, just not having to worry about transportation, uh, having those awkward conversations with said coworker when they're had, had too many, <laughs> you can easily just duck out. <laughs> it's a bit easier to do that online. Right. Um, but I, I do think that the cocktail kit programs will continue. Um, so if you are switching to do that format, continue with it. Don't, don't uh, have that as a temporary solution, you know, operate and run both and, and, you know, keep pushing full force. Great. And, and Jesse, where, where, where's retail going? What do, what do we do to become the next Jesse of our provinces? Yeah, well, hopefully you get privatized liquor. You need to uh, rise up against the powers that be a little bit. But, um, you know, I think I, I have been saying this for a while is that I really think where we're going is that we're on, on retail in Alberta, we're going to really see the two ends of the barbell and the center is going to disappear a little bit. You know, that like corner liquor store um, might go away. And what we're going to see is like, and I saw a little bit of a discussion on the chat on, on discounters. So you're going to see the people that are discount driven, like the big, big guys racing to the bottom. You're going to see convenience based buying, which in Alberta, a lot of that is, is tied to grocery on the retail side. So it's like, Hey, if I'm already at co-op buying my, my groceries for the week, and there's a liquor store in the same parking lot, a co-op liquor store, I'm going to go there. So you're going to have like discounts, convenience, and then experience. And, and so on the Vinar side, it's kind of similar to what, you know, a lot of my co-presenters have said about, you know, really, really focusing on the customer experience is, is that like knowing that this is, this is what we do and, and being unapologetic and really, really focusing on that and like knowing your customers and going, you know, above and beyond to give unique product and great service and, and, and knowledge that your competitors can provide. I just think you're going to really see that, that sort of space between those styles of, of retail stores, um, that gap widen, and we're going to see everything else get pushed out. And we're going to really see that like discounts, convenience, or experience. And it's just going to continue going that way, whether that's in store or, or virtually as, as a boutique store. Um, when we, we launch our e-commerce and our e-commerce has a long way to go and we've only been at it for a little bit, but that's really what, you know, wakes me up in the middle of the night is like, how do I give that same experience of that customer that comes into Vine Arts and I can talk to them and I can you know, pour them a sample of something uh, and I can, I can relate a story. How do I take that into the e-commerce realm? And we're not there yet. Like, we got a long way to go at Vine Arts, but that's going to be really a focus for us is how do we, as much as we can, give a, a similar experience or cater to that same client that, that wants to come into Vine Arts in person and that style of store, that, that end of the spectrum and deliver that online. And I don't have a perfect answer for that yet, but it's something we're really trying to, you know, keep top of mind when we're building out our website and e-commerce side of what we do. Great. And, and Ev, I mean, it, it almost feels like exasperating to ask because you're, you're so consistently imaginative, but like, what do you, what do you foresee your, your opening shift looking like? Where does the EC project go as the world reopens? I think that um, people are going to party 100% when the bars open. But in terms of the cocktail kits, like I'm not like, again, I'm not positioning myself to kind of compete with cocktail kits from bars and restaurants, like as just like salty and easy projects in particular, I'm looking to be like the hallmark of cocktail kits, like anybody who has a birthday, anybody who has like an anniversary or whatever, like I want to be sort of the call brand that they go to, to have those particular experiences put together for them. So I'm not essentially selling a cocktail kit per se, I'm selling a gift basket. Like I need to just position myself in that realm because it's so hard to wrap your head around because you want to make sure that whatever you do, like you do it with like integrity and like it's the goal that you've set out to do. But I've known like for the last three months that this is like a, a completely different thing that I've positioned myself to do, say like a year ago even. So like with my packaging, I probably spend the most money on packaging than anything else. Like when you open it up, the bottles aren't wrapped 
in like the, in a bubble wrap or whatever like that, we pack it to make sure that anyone who opens it is presented as a present and so are classes. So um, essentially that's kind of where I position the company, but um, for things that are sticking around in Ontario, I completely agree with what Jesse's saying. Like there's just three routes that people are gonna go and the convenience factor isn't going to be um, any better. Like everyone, like I'm sure anyone who's doing cocktail kits like in this chat knows this, everyone's gotten a lot crazier when like they realize that Amazon can deliver to them the next day. So even now, Amazon is no longer same day, 9 p.m., next day, 9 p.m. Like the instant gratification has like really kind of magnified tenfold since the pandemic starts. Because like, I'm actually like, I actually debated starting my own delivery company like during December when I was like crying in the corner because people couldn't get their stuff. So I think like with bars and restaurants opened up, like you're going to get a lot of guests who are much more appreciative that they're able to go in, pay a more premium price and be able to enjoy that experience. And then the rest will just essentially be like still kind of floating around the idea that they can get a cocktail kit. And that's the accessibility um, part of it. So uh, I think this is going to be a really interesting time for everyone to open up and see what it looks like. And I'm going to put another plug here because at the RC show, we're actually um, inviting some global bar giants to talk about sort of the other side of the coin because they've opened back up. They've built bars during the pandemic, including uh, Bonnie Kang uh, from Moo, Martin Hudak from Maybe Sammy and Sly Augustin from Trailer Happiness. So Sly's a great you'll kind of, yeah, you'll kind of get to see like what you know, a successful bar looks like um, in opened during the pandemic, pandemic when uh, Bonnie opened Moo and also um, what guest experience looks like on the other side. Because, you know, in Ontario, we haven't opened in what, like since December, November? Totally. I, I will say, and I encourage people to start thinking about questions if they have any, because we're going to wrap in a minute here. But I will say part of that civil is now open again. This is not a plug. This is about that turn. Um, uh, we've been open for the last three weeks with bartenders behind the bar because the convenience factor of people walking in and being like, I want a penicillin and getting a penicillin without having to make ginger juice has driven enough sales to keep the team employed. Um, and also has reminded everyone who works at Civil Liberties how hard bartending is. I feel like that's the one thing we haven't discussed for some of our classic bartenders. Um, is that they'll, like we have a physiotherapy center above the bar that we've opened for bartenders uh, that'll be free to the community when things really get going again. Cause like just you shake six cocktails in a row after nine months of not shaking six cocktails in a row and you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, what the fuck was that? And I feel like that's something our community, uh, that, that maybe will be part five of the spirited sessions is the long road home. Um, but I, we, we did notice in our first few weeks of being reopened that there was a huge towards Evelyn's point drive towards convenience uh, people were stopping by on their way home again, uh, in part maybe to have a little chat, but inversely just to really, uh, oh, I see Gabrielle in the chat here says, uh, Ramos gin fizz time. And I will tell you, we've already had some cruel regulars come into civil and be like, can I get two Ramos gin fizzes to go? It's like, they're not even going to be good. Like you're just doing it to make us suffer. Um, so guys, like we said, I, I desperately as a host try to avoid what I call zoom sprawl. Um, so we're coming up right on about the, the one hour mark. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and myself or John will read them to whoever you at or the group on the whole. I know Evan's here to support that as well. And we'll leave these last sort of 10 minutes uh, to be fielded by all, all these uh, greatly insightful minds. Hey, I just want to uh, jump in for, for one thing. And uh, here's, here's another shameless plug. Uh, I found uh, a Bar Mordecai uh, Aquarius season in my fridge. So I've been drinking. Um, so, so that's, it's great. Uh, uh, just to go back to your, uh, uh, question or your thing about, um, what law, law changes are significant. Uh, I promise I'll stay under four minutes. Uh, number one, everything right now needs to go from temporary to permanent, wherever you are, it doesn't matter where you are in the country. Good things will happen. If you take all these temporary measures and say, Hey, turn it into permanent. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, three, three years ago, Saskatchewan uh, started instituting uh, provincial tax markup 
um, uh, discounts based on your production um, for spirits, which is extremely significant because it wasn't a Canadian thing; it was a anything thing. So if you could if you could show that you were craft spirit or a small small spirit, uh, and you were only producing X amount, um, that tax markup uh, was 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 really low. So actually, our products are cheaper in Saskatchewan than they are in any, in any other part of Canada. Um, this past year, Manitoba copied that model. So Manitoba is now the second province to do that. That needs to happen more. And if it starts happening in larger significant markets, um, you, you're starting to shed away the, the, uh, the barriers to entry. So uh, that, that, those are my two big things. Um, turning temporary into permanent, like Ontario just did on January 1st, and creating a, a, a schedule markup based on production um, for, for tax. So. I'll pass it back on. Wow, you had so much time left, John. I am massively impressed. Um, By the way, and- so many people do that to me. Like, like actually, like actually do that to me. Like, like I remember Mike Ryan doing that to me once on a mezcal thing. It's I, I, I have not let you done that. Most of what I know about law and liquor has come from drinking nights with you, where I'm just like, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, huh, get a pen and paper and write down. The uh, I, it's I have to do it for a living. Like, it's like the only I put. It's what I have to do. Like, it's like it's not a hobby. I mean, it's fun, but it's what I do yeah. for a living. Um, <laughs> so I um, if I am. Um, Sorry, if I may, I have a question for my uh, co-panelists um, that I've been asking myself a lot as a bar owner uh, for when things going to go back to normal. With all the changing, all the, the staff who's been um, doing other work, going back to school, um, we being qualified as non essential worker, um, like how do you think the staff would be? Like we were, I mean... At the start of the pandemic, we were already missing um, some cooks, cook staff, kitchen staff, and uh, great bartenders. How do you think it's going to look like when everything's going to go back to normal? Do 50% of the staff just going to do something else? Or do you think they're going to come back? I think 50% have left already. And I think even if you look at the leadership, 50% have left. Uh, I think no one's talking about this, but it's going to be really hard to get people to go back to working till three in the morning. I think that was a lifestyle that started in people's twenties, mine included. And we pushed into our thirties and our forties. But now that everyone's like waking up at 8 a.m. to a week crash shot and like a at-home workout, being like, mm-hmm. hey, can you stay up till 3.30 in the morning and drink some Fernet with random strangers is gonna be so jarring that I, I really worry about not just finding staff. I worry about my, I still have my whole team uh, and we've, I'm worried about keeping them up at night again, but uh, I think that will be the, one of the biggest coming challenges. Uh, I also think uh, towards all the good work we've done collectively and showing people how hard it is, thank you for that, Gabriel, to make a cocktail. Uh, hopefully people are willing to pay a little bit more for cocktails in a bar so that we can pay a, a more standardized and stable living wage for our bartenders um, because there is value there. No, I think it's going to be one of the biggest challenge of the reopening to the mm-hmm. staff and the professional staff. Mm-hmm. But we will, we will do it. We will do it. Chris, do, do you think it'll be easier or harder finding catering staff towards Gabrielle's position? Well, I mean, a lot of my team came from, you know, where there were their previous industry pros who were just looking to do events on the side because they still enjoyed it enough to want to, you know, bartend a wedding or, or a festival at once a week kind of thing. So um, will it be difficult? I'm, I don't have an answer for you for that. But uh, I, I do see some of them coming back for sure. Will I get all of them? Definitely not. As a lot of them have already decided that, you know, they're basically have had it with the industry and they want to move on to uh, something a little bit more stable, um, you know, whether they, what they consider stable anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm sure. I think everyone's right about the large transitionary period. I also think this is, if you're a, if you're a unemployed bartender right now, um, or if you're somebody trying to figure out what to do in this last little bit, I know it could be a whole other spirit session, but I would highly encourage you to start thinking about how you learned cocktails and how you can provide that service to other bars because your value will be training. A lot of owners don't know how to cocktail bartend and don't have your skill. And now instead of a, you know, a weekly cocktail competition growing that community, you could maybe come in and do a lot of that training for a new generation. Oh, Evelyn has her hand up. Yes. I think like I'm, I'm going to say this just because I know I have had to lay off 150 staff 
um, during the pandemic. So I've actually like realistically have real talks with them saying, hey, I know this is the trajectory in which you think you're going to go, whether or not it be servers moving up to bartenders, hosts moving up to servers, bartenders moving up to bar managers, that scale, like GMs are now bar, now bar managers, bar managers might be bartenders because there's so many like less positions available. And you're right, like the dedicated people will still be in this industry. But don't forget that like before this industry, you have skills. And like, there are also skills that you've gained from this industry in which you can um, use in other different types of industries. And there are so many of, there are so many of my staff that were just like waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for bars to open. And eventually it had to be like, look, like go find something else to do for now. Like it will ultimately go back to normal. But the point that I made about a large transition period, we don't know how large that transition period is going to look like. It's not like you snap a finger and all the bars are going to go back to normal. There's going to be like a crazy amount of, um, I, I want it too. I miss taking shots of Fernet with you, man. Or maybe not for maybe a rum chata, but, rum chata, why not? <laughs> but uh, I think there's going to be a huge adjustment period in which you like people just don't understand the capacity issue so say if somebody has leadership skills maybe look into security like going into another thing that you're able to apply those skills into instead of just kind of sticking to what you're used to because it's going to be um like you're going to find a lot more success doing that or we can all get jobs in the marijuana industry which is the other giant move i have seen across the board uh, i was talking to my agco officer and he was like, I can't believe you're on weed. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, like four of the sites I've inspected have been bartenders I know from other places. And I think that's the, you know, I, I saw John do the hand motion and I agree. I, I actually really encourage everyone to. Uh, no, it's not that. It's, it's just, it's, 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 it's a newer thing in uh, uh, some provinces. It's oversaturated. Yeah. So like that, that's all. That's all oh, I have to say. There, there, are, there are six weed stores on the blocks of Liberty is at, and our logo is a pineapple. People still walk in being yeah. like, the weed store. I'm like, how could you get it wrong? Yeah, and, and it wrong? I've made a reference on the chat before, like, would you, I, you know, and I'm sure Jesse knows Al like Alcana bought out Liquor Depot. They're the largest publicly traded uh, uh, private retailer in North America, right? Liquor Depot got bought out by Alcana. They're 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 dividend paying out, um, but um, Alcana is a weed company, right? So some of the provinces, it's like there's way too many weed stores, mm -hmm. and then in in other provinces, yeah. So anyway. <laughs> hey guys, we are exactly where we promised to be, and I like to be a person who fulfills promises. We did exactly just over an hour, um, which is boop. Um, that being said, uh, if you have any additional questions, I'm sure you can DM any of us, and we're happy to be there. I really want to thank the panelists again. Take care, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Gabrielle. And um, yeah.